Hi, I'm Chris Giamo. And at TD Bank, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important financial issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by TD Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree, The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, and by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. Promotional support provided by NJ Advance Media. And by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. State Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We are coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in beautiful Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. By popular demand, we have them back. Joe Gingoli is CEO of Joseph Gingoli and Son, and also Jack Morris, President and CEO of Edgewood Properties. Gentlemen, you have, you're celebrating as we do this program, the one-year anniversary of Hard Rock in Atlantic City. It's a casino. It's more than a casino, right? The Hard Rock Atlantic City. Entertainment, restaurants, Got the whole thing going there. It's been about a year, Jack, so we had you guys here when it was happening. That's right. A lot of people from Atlantic City being employed. Yes. Of the 4,000 employees you have, you said 1,300 from AC? 1,300 from AC. How does that happen? Tell folks. It, it, it doesn't happen easy. Um, we worked hard, uh, worked with uh, the uh, local um, people of local Atlantic union. City. Local union, is that Local 54? Local 54. Uh, Joe worked really hard with everybody to make this happen. And we're real proud of uh, what we said we're going to deliver. We delivered that. And uh, we're doing great things in Atlantic City. So when you came here last year, Jack, you talked about the fact that you wanted to hire people from Atlantic City. But it, it, it wasn't easy. What makes it challenging? You know, it was, it was actually not that hard. Uh, we focused on Atlantic City residents. Uh, our HR department and, um, of course, our partners and the operator Hard Rock uh, was on board with that. Uh, we opened up with 20% of our employees as Atlantic City residents. And what happened as we constricted for the winter months, it, that number went up, went up to 25%, hmm. which said that when our managers could pick who to keep, they kept Atlantic City residents, which is what we knew there was a viable, trainable workforce there. We partnered ourselves and all the other casinos with Local 54, and with the support of Rob Angelo and the Department, the Department of, Labor. of Labor. Right, Secretary we, of Labor. Yep, yeah, we started the first workforce development program in the history of Atlantic City, and it's up and running. It's funded by uh, half with the Department of Labor and the industry kicking in the other half. Public-private partnership. Yes, sir. So, Jack, let me say, we've known each other a long time. We've, we've talked about a whole range of things offline as well. What I'm curious about is, did, did, did you see, both of you have been very successful in developing building, making things happen. When you went into AC, lots of questions, lots of challenges, still a whole range of issues. We're going to be doing a special on Atlantic City in the next couple of months. Did you have a lot of doubts about the potential for success? No, I had Why no not? doubts. Uh, because we knew that Atlantic City um, needed and wanted to put people to work, and Atlantic City residents uh, were, were, were great people who just needed an opportunity. And uh, New Jersey's a great state, one of the most densely populated states in the country. Uh, we're surrounded by uh, Pennsylvania and New York, mm -hmm. and it just needed a, a kick in the you-know-what. And, yeah. and that's, I think, what we showed that we could do it. The other, sorry for interrupting. The other thing that's really fascinating to me is that we've done a, a lot of work on prisoner reentry, reentering to society, ex-offenders. Because people are like, listen, they broke the law. It's not my business. Whatever happened, keep them in jail. No, they get out. 
You two guys, with others, have been working on an initiative to hire ex-offenders. Make the case. Yes. Um, we, uh, we partnered with uh, uh, Atlantic County Court System, and they have Drug Court, which is a uh, around the country, very successful program. We asked if uh, they could change the name to Recovery Court, mm -hmm. and those graduates uh, coming through our workforce development program are being hired by us and other casinos, and we've had, a, uh, had good results. What have you found? It's saying good results is one thing, Joe, but what have you found? Because there are a whole bunch of people watching right now and say, really? I don't think I'd do that. Make the case that it's been a good thing. Well, the case is giving people opportunity who want to change their life and have had made past mistakes and giving them good jobs, union jobs with benefits, uh, has had a very positive result for us as a casino and for the city. What do you think it's meant for the city, Jack? Well, I can tell you that people that come to Hard Rock um, always comment on how great uh, the service, the staff, how people were polite, nice to them, and no matter what happens, uh, they had, you know, experience, they had a wait in line, you know, an elevator broke, something happened. The staff has been incredible, and they would come back time and time again. Uh, and, and I think that that shows for uh, what we've done and, 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 and what the program is, is doing, for, not only for Atlantic City, mm. but just the people come up to me that work there, employees come up to me, and are so thankful to have a job and, and have what we built. How rewarding. I'm proud of it. Very, very. How rewarding. Incredible. We walk around the casino sometimes, Jack, myself, my brother Michael, Jim Allen, our, our partner yep. at the Hard, from the Hard Rock, Rock, and talk to the different employees, and they come up and, and thank us, tell us about their families, and they do the same thing with our guests. And, you know, that has uh, brought, brought our guests back. Yeah. yeah. Real quick before I let you go, um, a sense of community and making a difference. Charitable works for a long time, supporting public broadcasting, our production operation, as well as uh, the chair of a major health care system. Thank you. In the state of New Jersey, RWJ Barnabas Health. Where does that come from? Because you're business people, you're bottom line gentlemen who want to make sure you make a profit, but you've, oh, I've always noticed. And it's not only about making a profit, it's about doing the right thing. And that's what both of us have been about, and that's what really gave us the opportunity to say, let's look at something that somebody else wouldn't look at, that the Wall Street guys wouldn't look at. Why? Because the bottom line may not look just, right to them? It just didn't look right to them. You know, it didn't, it didn't fit in their box. But we saw an opportunity, and we knew that people needed a second chance. And, uh, and I think we proved it. Look at the double-digit uh, increases in Atlantic City revenues. And it's not just casinos. You're starting to see businesses uh, that are now coming to Atlantic City, and that's going to continue. By the way, let's make it clear. The national unemployment rate is around 3.6. The unemployment rate in the Atlantic City area is registered at 6%. I mean, it's not the same as the rest of the country. Where's your sense of making a difference come from? You know, um, grew up in the business. I had opportunity in my life and thought, you know, if others had the same opportunity, what would the outcome be? Would it be different? And um, from a business standpoint, social responsibility is a currency. And um, Quite frankly, uh, our uh, Lieutenant Governor, Sheila Oliver, has really acknowledged that that's what we're doing in Atlantic City and given us a tremendous amount of support for it. The state needs to be involved in this. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't do it alone? No. Someone says, let the private sector do it alone. You say? I think the private sector leads. They have to lead. It's their industry. And then we need support from uh, the body politic. Absolutely. And that partnership makes for the success. Joe and Jack, we appreciate you joining us. Um, let's make sure we continue to monitor the progress, not Thank just you. of your casino, but truthfully of Atlantic City overall. Atlantic City. Because people often forget, yeah, it's Atlantic City is down there. They have trouble. They're, maybe they're coming back, maybe not. It's everyone in the state who is affected by what's going on in AC. And we appreciate what you're doing. And Thank more you. importantly, we'll continue to Thanks for giving us the monitor the progress. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. You got it. This is State of Affairs. Stay right there. This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're at NJTV Studios in Newark, and we'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato.
State of Affairs is pleased to welcome Tim Sullivan, CEO, New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Good to see you, Tim. Yes, thanks so much for having me. For those who may not have read or don't know what the EDA is, describe it. Well, the Economic Development Authority is uh, one of the state's uh, principal uh, uh, organizations that's driving economic growth and innovation all throughout the state. We you, do that. You drive it? We try to. G give us an example of what it means to drive. So we partner with the private sector, we partner with corporations, we partner with institutions of higher ed uh, education to really focus on the, 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 uh, the state's economic competitiveness to help uh, attract and retain businesses, to help attract and retain talent, and to build vibrant communities. Challenging? No doubt, but uh, that, that's what makes it fun. You know, let, let's do this. Uh, I, I said this before. We had uh, Jose Lozano from Choose New Jersey. Choose New Jersey and the EDA are collaborators, partners with us in a series we're doing with a whole range of others, academic institutions like NJIT and others, on a series called The Future of Innovation. You'll see a graphic up there. So here's what I'm curious about. Governor Murphy talks about an innovation economy, mm -hmm. right? What's the difference between promoting innovation and an innovation economy? I think they're two sides of the same coin. Uh, an innovation economy, you know, New Jersey was Silicon Valley before there was a Silicon Valley. The, the discoveries that, that were hatched in academic and corporate laboratories uh, here in New Jersey really fueled. Starting with Edison? Starting with Edison and, and you know, even further back into the, into the pharmaceutical industry and the, you know, the mid-19th century in, in places like New Brunswick uh, with companies like Johnson & Johnson uh, that, that, that took root here. That, you know, th those discoveries that made us the medicine chest of the world that, that, that fueled uh, some of the most important innovations that drove the American economy, the global sure. economy, um, are responsible for so many jobs that were created over the last you know, 100 plus years. And that's really what the innovation economy is all about. How do you translate and commercialize uh, the kinds of uh, innovative uh, research and development activities that either happen at, at institutions of higher education with the faculty or students, or in corporate uh, labs that are you know, working on the next uh, big thing for, for, any, for a given company? You know, it's interesting. I've said this many times. I'll say it again. We're looking forward to uh, securing an interview with Governor Murphy. We're going to talk to him about a whole range of issues. One of them, in fact, will be what this innovation economy is all about, what it means to you, and how he's going to try to get this implemented. But what I'm curious about is if you were to define the in innovation economy, are there, are there multiple areas of this? I'm curious. I heard there were five. I don't want to get into the weeds here. And by the way, if you want to look at the detailed um, report on the innovation economy, can they get it at your website? Absolutely, right on the front page. Jackie Heyer, our executive producer, could you put up the website so people can check it out? It, give me the areas. Is it biotech? So innovation is both a, is really a discipline that cuts across lots of different industries. So certainly biotech, technology, digital media, film and television. So, hold uh, on, you separate digital media from film and television? Uh, to, film a certain, television? Uh, to a certain extent, yeah. You have companies okay. that are you know producing uh, you know apps and music sharing and, and uh, streaming services and video companies that are you know principally online versus uh, coming across your television um, or, or viewed in a theater. And so um, yeah, there's lots of different parts. That advanced manufacturing, technology, and innovation is fueling so much of what happens in the value-added parts of the manufacturing economy. Renewable energy, that's all about innovation. Uh, how, do you, how do you turn wind into power that comes out of people's uh, comes That's out of the innovation socket. economy? It infuses all those things, absolutely. It's the lifeblood of any, of any growing economy in the 21st century is what? innovation. Dis you know, research, and dis research and development, discovery, and commercialization. But is the, okay, let's be clear on this. And there's, listen, again, you don't need me to tell you that the EDA is in the news for a whole range of reasons, but one of them is this. And there's lawsuits going back and forth and not what we are talking about. We're talking about public policy. You can follow that stuff in other media platforms, including NJTV News, which is doing a great job covering it. But what I'm also curious about, in the context of that debate going on between the governor, the Senate president, others involved in this, is, is the EDA a government agency, or is it outside of government? What is it? Yeah, so the, the technical character, uh, we're an independent authority, but we're in but not of the Department of Treasury. Hold on. In but not of, in define that. Of. Uh, it's a legal term that actually has, you know, been sort of litigated and discussed quite a bit. Um, it means we're basically part of, but not not an immediate um, uh, subsidiary of the Treasury Department. But we're part of that, the part of the family. You don't report. Do you report to the governor? Or report to your board. I report to the board, but the the governor has appointment authority over uh, the majority of the board seats, and so there's a very close relationship there. So here's here's the larger question. I'm fascinated by it from a public policy point of view. Help people understand, Tim. Mm -hmm. The whole question of quote unquote tax incentives. Sure. It does, by the way, tax incentives and tax, cre tax credits, exactly the same thing? More, more or less, yep. Okay, so the Camden issue, again, check it out. But there are a whole range of other communities mm -hmm. across the state where there are tax credits, tax incentives, mm -hmm. Jersey City, Newark, New Brunswick, wherever. What is, in your view, from a policy point of view, sure. the appropriate role of tax incentives, tax credits, in fueling the economy in a community as opposed to saying, let the private sector do it on their own, and if the EDA 
isn't involved and there's no tax credits, I guess it's not going to happen. So I think, you know, the Governor Murphy's been clear on this. Incentives have to be and tax credits have to be a tool in the toolkit to advance an economic development strategy. But they have to be a tool in service of a strategy. You've got to be working towards a goal. And that goal for us is recapturing our leadership position in the innovation economy, having more of the companies that are going to fuel the 21st and 22nd century economy be born here, grow here, and thrive here. And so tax incentives have to be one tool in the toolkit, but they can't be the only tool Name in the toolkit. Name some of the other tools we're talking about. So we have, you know, we have to have a strategy that... Um, that focuses on uh, on a talent strategy, and that that centers more uh, more than anything else on on two things: higher education. How do we attract? Why higher ed? Because that is the talent is the most precious commodity in the 21st century economy, and so having students that are educated here and stay here and either build businesses or build their lives or build their you know go to work Before at New Jersey move companies. Off that brain, drain a pro brain drain a problem. I think we'd certainly like to keep more of the homegrown talent that goes through our you know world class uh, public many, education system. We'd certainly like to keep more of them. Absolutely. Is that part of the innovation economy? Absolutely. Talent is the fundamental driver of the, of the innovation economy. Companies are chasing talent, and talent wants to be in places that are walkable, bikeable, mixed use, mixed income, uh, that have a dynamism and a 24-7, or at least something close to 24-7 um, kind of vibe. Uh, that means restaurants, it means bars, it means uh, parks, it means all those things that go into a quality of life um, in urban centers and, and downtowns that are walkable near transit. All those things are part of the mix of how mm -hmm. do you have a successful innovation economy. Yeah, stay, stay on the toolkit. Toolkit transportation. Toolkit is education. Mm -hmm. Toolkit is, let me ask you this. With the Economic Development Authority, how much do you focus on the fact that there are some businesses who, who complain about the tax rate and how, what they pay in the state, and they say, it's too expensive, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Is tax policy a toolkit? I don't just mean tax mm -hmm. incentives and tax sure. credits, but overall tax policy. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's in the mix. The two things that the governor and, I, governor and I hear most consistently from companies, both big and small, when we're around the state or around the world talking about New Jersey as a place to build a business, the two things we hear about first and foremost, talent and infrastructure. Can they find the people that they need to grow the business in the way that they want to do? And can those people get to and from work with some predictability and affordability? And can their goods and services get back out to the marketplace uh, with, with some predictability? Those are the top two, almost without exception. Got it. Tax policy plays a role, tax incentives play a role, but there has to be a fundamental strategic rationale for a company to be here. By itself, that's not getting done. So when the Amazon deal doesn't take place in New York, some say, well, you know, they, 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 um, again, a Pandora's box I'm opening. But that itself was, isn't isn't purely a question of tax incentives. There's a whole bunch of other issues involved, correct? Well, sure. I, you know, I, I can't speak for Amazon, but in my, they, they picked Long Island City uh, for a period of time and Northern Virginia because of a lot of reasons. The proximity to a talented workforce has to be at the top of that list. Yeah. Before I let you go, the New Jersey uh, Innovation Evergreen Fund, uh, 20 seconds on it. New Jersey fell from 5th to 15th in venture capital from 2007 to 17. Venture capital is the lifeblood of the innovation economy. The governor's got an innovative proposal to partner with big companies, small companies, and venture capital investors to grow more homegrown New Jersey success stories. This is Tim Sullivan, CEO, Economic Development Authority in the state of New Jersey. Um, this is part of our ongoing series on innovation. I'll repeat again that the EDA is one of our collaborators and our partners, and frankly, one of the funders, uh, along with a whole range of other academic institutions and others with that initiative. I want to disclose that fully. Thank you, Tim, for joining us. We appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much for having the me. conversation of going. Course. State of Affairs, coming to you from NJTV's Agnes Vera Studio. We'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. This is Debbie Walsh, Director of the Center for American Women and Politics at Rutgers University we were talking about. Let's disclose, previously, we were both Eagleton fellows. fellows. Right, in the graduate program at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. Yes, I barely got in and barely got out. So uh, <laughs> let's do this, Debbie. Let's talk about women in politics. Um, women make up what percent of the population in New Jersey? About 51% in, in New Jersey and nationally. And in the state legislature in New Jersey, of the 100 and 20 members of that august body, there are how many women? About 31% of the legislature is female. 31? 31%. Uh, because? Oh, so many reasons, Steve. Um, New Jersey has been a tough place for women to break in. Uh, I will tell you that at 31%, we're doing better than we have in a very long time. Uh, we rank 19th in the nation. 
Uh, we used to be, just a year ago, 13th in the nation, but when the elections happened in 2018 and we saw so many women getting elected across the country, even though New Jersey's numbers stayed the same, we dropped in our rank. Um, but we are doing better. It used to be 15 years ago, we were in the bottom 10 mm. with Alabama and Mississippi. Um, and a lot of work has been done to try to increase the number of women in office in New Jersey. But there remain a lot of hurdles. And I think in large part, the greatest one is the party structure. Yeah, let's talk about this. Is it fair to say that most of the party leaders, the party structure, the party power brokers, those who you don't read about, well, put it this way, you don't see them on this show a lot, but they're the folks who make a lot of decisions about who gets the run. They're just middle-aged and older white men. Older white men. And if you look around the state on both sides of the aisle, um, I think it's only about nine women who are currently state party, uh, who are currently county party chairs. Right. Uh, the rest of them are all men. And those folks make a lot of decisions about who gets to run and, frankly, who doesn't get to run. Not always looking for women. Not always looking for women. And it's not necessarily a transparent process in New Jersey. Um, a lot of the times these decisions are made behind closed doors and women are not in the room. We run a nonpartisan campaign training program called Ready to Run in New Jersey. We get close to 200 women every year who sign up and they are ready to run and they may think that they're in line, but sometimes the line moves and uh, they don't know quite how to get there. Is the quote unquote old boys network as alive and well and not so well for a lot of reasons as it was 15, 20 years ago? I think it's better. Things have improved, but there is still... I think that what's improved is I think some of the men out there who run the show have realized that it's a good thing for them it's to run politics. women. It's smart politics to run women. But I think the men are still largely the folks making those decisions. Women aren't in the inside, um, in those back rooms when a lot of these decisions are made in most of the counties. Me Too made a difference? The Me Too movement made any difference? Has, has it made, in your view, any difference in men who were involved in these decisions being aware enough smart enough, practical enough, do the right thing, and put women out there. We'd like to think so. We'd like to think that this is having an impact here in New Jersey. I think it definitely has had an impact nationally. It has. I think we saw it in 2018 with record numbers of women running for office, state legislatures, Congress, and record numbers of women winning. Um, largely, almost exclusively on the Democratic side, Republican yep. women still have a long way to go. But here in New Jersey, I think it's been slower. We did, we did manage to go from one woman member of Congress in, from New Jersey to two. By the way, Mikey Sherrill, excuse me for interrupting, sat right there, Congresswoman Sherrill. Check out that interview you did with her. And she talked about how many women came in in this class. Yeah. In it this was, class in Congress. She said it's very refreshing. 36 women. It's the largest freshman class that we've seen of women. Uh, again, almost exclusively on the Democratic side of all of those newly elected women. One, one newly elected Republican woman last What's time. up with the Republicans? It's a complicated situation. So the Republican Party in general does not put the kind of resources into women's candidacies that the Democratic side does. Not just with the party itself, but outside organizations. There is nothing comparable to an EMILY's List pack for Democratic pro-choice women on the Republican EMILY's side. EMILY's List, it's a great way to raise money for women. Fantastic for way to raise money. <clears throat> But Trump. also on the Republican sorry, side, ahead. on the Republican side, there is a real reluctance to identify with the concept of identity politics. Huh? Well, their idea is on the Republican side is that the best candidate will rise to the top, whoever that is, and you don't necessarily need women or people of color to represent the interests of women. Well, how and about people representing the population? Yep, they'll say that the best candidates will come to the fore and that's how to do it. Um, Paul Ryan said when he was speaker that the reason there is the kind of partisan divide and gridlock in Washington, D.C. was because of identity politics. The Democratic Party embraces identity politics and that helps when it comes to recruiting women candidates. Let me ask you, someone listening, <clears throat> excuse me right now, saying, oh, uh, Debbie Walsh and Rutgers from the uh, American Women, excuse me, the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers, She's, she's speaking, and she's clearly favoring the Democrats and is being critical of the Republicans. You say facts are facts? I say facts are facts, but I also say if we're ever going to get to political parity in this country for women, both parties have to do the work. And we need the Republican Party to do more. We need more Republican women in office. We need more women on both sides of the aisle. We're at about 
we're still less than a quarter women in Congress, but the Democrats are doing much better. The Republicans need to do better. And the Democratic women in Congress tell us they want to see more Republican women in office, and the Republican women in Congress tell us Two the same left. thing. Is there a women's caucus? Is it real? There is a bipartisan caucus in Washington for women's issues that is not nearly as strong as it used to be. Uh, it is much harder these days for that kind of work across the aisle to exist. This is Debbie Walsh from the, she's the director of the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University, my alma mater. They try to ignore that, but they can't. Uh, <laughs> thank we you. We claim to, you, we claim you. Yeah, once in a while, thank you. This is State of Affairs, I'm Steve Adubato. Let's continue the conversation. Follow me on Twitter at Steve Adubato. See you next time. Thank you very much. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by TD Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, Community Food Bank of New Jersey. NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, and by Choose New Jersey, promotional support provided by NJ Advance Media, and by ROINJ. What is your child's dream for the future? Doctor? Teacher? Architect? Whatever they aspire to be, a college education may realize those dreams. And NJ Best can help. It's the college savings plan specifically designed for New Jersey families. Start saving today with as little as $25, because now is the time to invest in their future. To learn about NJ Best 529 College Savings Plan, its investment objectives, risks, and costs, read the investor handbook available at njbest.com.